Before we get into the specifics of photosynthesis and respiration, which is the focus of this unit, we have some other concepts that we need to talk about. First of all, this idea that all life requires free energy to grow, to reproduce, and to maintain order. Let's talk about the first one, energy to grow. Unfortunately, we see on the news these stories of children that have been abused, and sometimes they're malnourished, they're not given a lot of food. And so we find sometimes these older children that are like 15, 16 years old, but they are the size of a nine-year-old because it takes excess energy for organisms to grow. Organisms also need excess energy in order to reproduce. We know that women that severely limit their calories, one of the first processes that is um, shut down by the body is their ability to reproduce. They'll stop releasing eggs. And then finally, organisms need energy to maintain order. And I put this diagram down here so that you understand that all the structures of your cells are highly organized. They are built of proteins, carbs, lipids, nucleic acids um, in a very particular arrangement. And it takes the input of energy to maintain these different organelles and cell parts. If you think about your house, over time, your house is going to break down. We're going to see damage um, to like the roof and so on. And it's going to take you providing energy to fix and maintain those structures of your house. So it takes free energy for organisms to maintain order. We also talk about processes like active transport. Active transport takes ATP, and we're trying to concentrate molecules on one side of the membrane. So that's a process where we're trying to maintain order. We're trying to organize and concentrate molecules in an area using active transport. Now, if we take a look at our producers, we're going to say that producers get free energy in the form of light. And when we take a look at organisms that consume, or the heterotrophs, is the heterotrophs are going to get free energy from the organic molecules that they consume or they eat. So sometimes when we think of free energy, think of food. We can get energy from our food. So this says the loss of order or free energy is going to cause the death of an organism. That should make sense. If you're not taking in energy, if you're not taking in food, then eventually it's going to lead to death of the organism. In simpler terms, what's going to happen is you're not getting food, so we're not getting any glucose. We need the glucose to make the ATP, so we will not be able to make ATP. And we need ATP to facilitate these reactions that are leading to the maintenance and the building of our cell structures, like the uh, cytoskeleton and so on. So if our structures in our cells are going to start to break down because there's no energy to repair them, then that's going to lead to cell death. And when multiple cells die, that's going to lead to the death of the organism. So this should make sense to you. If you are using more energy than what you're taking in, so let's say you're working out and you're burning calories more than what you're taking in, then you're going to have a loss of mass. And if this continues to happen, then eventually it can lead to death. If you're burning more calories and using energy faster than what you're intaking it. Now, if you have an excess of free energy, so imagine if you're taking in a lot of calories, a lot of energy, then you're going to end up storing that excess if you're not using it all. So if an organism has an excessive intake of organic molecules and free energy, then we're going to take those extra molecules that are not being used and we're going to store them. So excess free energy intaken by an organism can be stored. So if we're taking in more energy than what we're using, then we're going to have a gain of mass. We're going to store those excess molecules that can supply us with free energy. Now let's take a look at this diagram down here. It says students measure the mass of organisms before and after being placed in the dark for 24 hours. None of the organisms were provided nutrients during the 24 hour period. The data is shown in the table. So here we have an elodia, which is an aquatic plant, and we can see that over 24 hours in the dark, we have a drop in mass. That is because it's using some of its stored energy and converting it into ATP. As we break down those organic molecules to make ATP, then we're losing organic molecules in our body. We're losing mass. Same with the goldfish. We can tell that the goldfish is losing mass because it's using up its stored energy, its stored organic molecules, because we're not feeding it during that 24-hour time. 
Same with the sea anemone. We can see that lots of mass. So this is just showing you that you should be able to look at data like that and draw conclusions like the organisms were not receiving free energy. The plant wasn't getting light to make more organic molecules in storm. Instead, it was just using its supply of starch and glucose. Same with those, um, the fish and the sea anemone. So that should explain the decrease in mass. We're using our energy reserves to make ATP. So therefore, mass is going to go down. Now, on this page, we're going to talk about some of the laws related to thermodynamics. You will not have to be able to restate these laws, but you need to understand what they're talking about. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy can never be created nor destroyed, but it's transferred from one form to the other. Let's take a look at this equation for photosynthesis. You should be able to recognize that would be the equation for photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, we say that light energy is transferred or is being converted into a new form of energy. It's being converted into chemical energy in the form of glucose. Glucose is a form of chemical energy. When we look at the equation for respiration, and again, you should be able to look at this next equation and say, say yeah, that's respiration. Then we say that chemical energy, so glucose is chemical energy, when we break down glucose, we can free up some of that energy and we can use it to build ATP. So we say that chemical energy is being converted or transferred into a new form of chemical energy. ATP is another form of chemical energy. It's a kind of a pet peeve whenever our students will say, during respiration, energy is created. It's not. It's being transferred from glucose to ATP molecules. Now, the next law, the second law of thermodynamics, states that the entropy of the universe is always increasing. Entropy is just a fancy way to say disorder. The disorder of the universe is always increasing. What that kind of means is that if you left a system, then the system over time is going to break down. It's going to become more disorderly. Think about your backpack. So let's say if you just kind of let your backpack go then over time, imagine what it's going to look like in your backpack. You're going to have papers everywhere. I've seen some of your backpacks. So when a system is left on its own, it's going to become more disorderly. Entropy or disorder is going to increase in that system. So in the universe, we say that there's always an increase in disorder over time. Another way to state that, or to try to explain why the disorder of the universe is always increasing, is because every time we convert energy from one form to the next, some of that energy is released into the universe to increase disorder. So energy conversions are never 100% efficient. In every energy conversion, some energy is lost to the universe as heat. And the loss of heat with every conversion of energy leads to more disorder in the universe. I put this diagram on here because I see diagrams like this on the AP exam. And it's showing you that when we have energy transfers, that some of the energy is lost as heat. This is showing you plants are absorbing light energy, solar radiation. So plants are taking light energy and they're converting it into biomass, and that is organic molecules. So if a plant absorbs a thousand kilojoules of energy and makes organic molecules, we're not going to find a thousand kilojoules of energy in those organic molecules. We maybe find more like 90. Let's write that. So let's say that this is absorbing a thousand kilojoules and it's using that energy to build organic molecules. Those organic molecules are going to contain some of that, let's say like 900 kilojoules, kilojoules, but then about 100 kilojoules was lost to the universe as heat energy. So no energy transfer is 100% efficient. Some energy is going to be lost as heat. On this page, we're going to continue with this idea of the second law of thermodynamics, that when we convert energy from one form to the other, it's never 100% efficient, that we're going to lose some of the energy in the form of heat. Now, I'm really going to simplify this page, maybe compared to previous years. What I need you to understand is that in respiration, we're going to take glucose and 
we kind of need to get away from saying the glucose is going to be broken down because really what we're going to do is we're going to send glucose through a series of reactions and we're just going to rearrange the carbon hydrogen oxygen atoms and as we rearrange these bonds then there's some free energy that is available to make ATP now if we took a look at all the energy that is in some glucose molecules that we're going to convert to ATP. So let's say that we have some glucose molecules and we have 686 kilocalories of energy stored in the bonds of those glucose molecules. Okay. When we take the glucose and we end up making ATP, so we're going to transfer energy to ATP molecules. When we look at those ATP molecules that were made from this amount of glucose, we only find this. We only find 219 kilocalories of energy in those ATP molecules. So obviously we're missing some energy. When we do the math, this tells us that only 32% of the energy from the glucose is now found in those ATP molecules. So we're kind of inefficient at transferring chemical energy from glucose into chemical energy of ATP. So what those calculations are just attempting to show you is that only 32% of the energy that comes from glucose, when we break down glucose and rearrange those bonds, rearrange those atoms, only about 32% of the energy is going to be transferred to ATP. But we're going to lose about 68% of the energy as heat. Now, in class, we're going to address these types of problems. So for now, we're just going to skip them, move on to the next page. Since we just talked about that reactions of the body release some energy as heat, I want to tackle this next idea. So the question is, who requires more free energy? And I'm going to note per gram. Of tissue the elephant or the shrew so who needs more food is basically what this is asking well you're probably saying this is an easy question the elephant's going to eat more food in a day than the shrew and that's true but it's who's going to need more energy per gram of the organism's tissue and in this case it's actually the shrew so let's talk about why that's the case the elephant actually has a lower metabolism compared to the shrew In the last unit, we talked about surface to volume ratio and cells that have a high surface to volume ratio more efficiently exchange materials with the environment. Well, the shrew has a high surface to volume ratio, so it's exchanging heat at a much greater rate than the elephant. So since the shrew can exchange heat or lose heat at a greater rate to the environment, then it's really hard for the shrew to actually maintain its body temperature and that's critical for the shrew that it can do that. So to generate this heat necessary to maintain the shrew's body temperature, it has a greater metabolism. That means more reactions are going to be taking place in the shrew per gram of tissue compared to the elephant. You may be heard that a shrew has to eat 80 to 90 percent of its body weight in food daily and if it doesn't intake that much free energy then it can die. And that's also the case here with the hummingbird, is the hummingbird has to constantly eat, and if it even goes a few hours without a meal, then it can die. So again, let's take a look at this question. Who requires more free energy, the snake or the hummingbird? And again, it's per gram of tissue. Now, we have two different types of organisms here in this case. The snake is considered an ectotherm. You might think of X or external. Ectotherms, they rely on external energy sources to help them regulate their body temperature. So when we're talking about ectotherms, we're basically talking about cold-blooded creatures. As the temperature in the environment drops, so does their body temperature. If the environment temperature goes up, then so does their body temperature as well. So their body temperature is dependent on external energy sources. On cool days, sometimes snakes will come out and they'll lay on warm rocks. They're trying to elevate their body temperatures. A hummingbird is an endotherm. So think of N. 
Endotherms are warm-blooded creatures, and that means that we're capable of internal generation of heat. And this heat comes from those metabolic reactions. Remember, in respiration, every time energy is converted from one molecule to the next, some of that energy is released as heat. For endotherms, our body temperature does not fluctuate with the environment. So if it's 70 degrees in the classroom and your body temperature starts to drop, because remember you're at about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, then you're going to start to shiver. And what you're doing is you're increasing the number of reactions that are taking place in your body. And with all those reactions, heat is being generated. And that'll help you keep your body temperature where it needs to be at 98.6. Now, if you have had pets, maybe you've had a snake or you've had a gerbil. If you have um, a gerbil, you're going to have to feed it pretty often, almost daily. But if you have a snake, then you can maybe feed it once every couple weeks or maybe even once a month. We ourselves would probably die if we weren't fed once a month. The difference is, is snakes don't require as much energy because they're not regulating their body temperature using these internal reactions. Whereas we do, because we're endotherms. As a matter of fact, most of the energy from our food is actually used just to maintain our body temperature. So we require more food or more free energy per gram of tissue than ectotherms. So the answer to our question is that the hummingbird is going to require more free energy per gram of tissue. Now, I've included a couple more terms in these boxes. And these aren't terms that you need to have memorized. But I just wanted to show them to you in case you ever see them. And one means that there's a changing body temperature. And the other one means that they maintain a constant body temperature. And that relates to this diagram down here. So here we have environmental temperature changing. So let's put some numbers on here for reference. We have 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. And an exotherm's body temperature is going to vary as the temperature of the environment changes. So whenever the temperature is very cold, the exotherm is going to have a very low body temperature. And then as the temperature increases, so is the body temperature of the exotherm. But endotherms are going to have a constant body temperature because we can maintain that using internal reactions. Let's emphasize, though, that the maintenance of body temperature here in these colder temperatures is due to increased metabolic reactions. Because you're going to start shivering. And your body's also going to do things like divert your blood internally to keep your vital organs warm. It's going to send less blood to the surface where it can lose heat. So your body's going to change so that you can keep this constant body temperature. However, whenever our body temperatures start to exceed 98.6, so we're talking about in this area right here, then our body's going to respond in ways to make sure that our temperature doesn't become too elevated. So we're going to start to sweat. We're going to send blood to the surface. So that some heat can be released to the environment. And your brain is even going to send messages to you that it's going to make you feel more lethargic. It's like your brain knows that if you move around a lot, then you're going to increase the amount of reactions taking place and you're going to generate heat with all those reactions. When you're really hot, you have a tendency to want to lay around and not move much. To summarize, the main points you need to understand, the smaller the animal, the greater the metabolism. And students, before they hear this lesson, usually think it's the opposite. And also, endotherms are going to have a higher metabolism compared to exotherms because we have to maintain a constant body temperature. Now, as promised, we're going to revisit this idea of entropy. And I said, whenever you hear the word entropy, I want you to substitute in the word disorder. And we're going to relate this idea of entropy to photosynthesis and respiration. So again, entropy is the measure of disorder in a system. If there's high entropy in a system, then that means there's high disorder. So let's relate entropy to your bedroom. Does your bedroom have high or low entropy? If it has high entropy, then that means you have a very messy bedroom. If it has low entropy, then that means there's less disorder. It means you're very neat. 
Now, let's take a look at these two diagrams, and let's decide which one of these diagrams is showing a system where there is higher or lower entropy. So again, we're talking about this order. Now, I like to relate this to Legos. So here I have pieces of Legos, and they're scattered all over the place. And then I take these Legos, and I put them together, and I build this more complex structure. When the Legos aren't put together, they're scattered everywhere. So there's more disorder. So this is a situation that has higher entropy. And this is actually a more stable system. You can't really break down Legos any more than after they're broken down and they're all apart from one another. Here we have a more organized structure. It has lower entropy. And think of Legos. Whenever you build these complex structures, they're pretty unstable. It's pretty easy to break them. So the more organized a molecule is or a system is, then act that actually makes it less stable. It's more likely to break down the more orderly it is. If you haven't realized it yet, we've got CO2 molecules and we've got water molecules, and these are the reactants necessary for photosynthesis so that glucose can be created. So let's relate photosynthesis to entropy. Photosynthesis is a process that decreases the entropy or the disorder of a system. It took unorganized molecules that were greatly disordered and it made them more organized. So we decreased disorder, we decreased entropy. You know that it takes light energy for photosynthesis to occur. So anytime we're decreasing disorder or we're making molecules more structured or more ordered, it's always going to take an input of energy. Think of your room and when your room has high entropy or high disorder, it's not going to clean itself as much as you wish that would happen. It's going to take an input of energy for you to make your bedroom more structured. Or it's going to take you energy to decrease the entropy of your bedroom. Now, we have a term for processes that require energy. And they're called endergonic reactions. So since photosynthesis requires energy and it requires light energy, Photosynthesis is considered an endergonic reaction. Light energy is used to synthesize glucose. And again, going back to the bedroom example, the cleaning of your bedroom is not going to be spontaneous. It's not just going to happen on its own. It's going to require energy to do this. And just like photosynthesis, since it needs energy as well, for this process to occur, photosynthesis is not a spontaneous reaction. Think about it. Around you right now, you have CO2 molecules and you have water molecules, and you don't see glucose forming together in the atmosphere and just falling at your feet. So this is a reaction that is not spontaneous. It takes a considerable amount of energy for these reactants to become more organized into a glucose molecule. Now let's relate entropy to the opposite of photosynthesis, respiration. So again, we have glucose being broken down into water and CO2 during the process of respiration. So again, glucose is more organized. Hopefully you can fill in these blanks in these charts. It has low disorder, it has low entropy. This is less stable. This is like the Legos all put together. You have a highly organized molecule. So when you have something that's highly organized, it's more likely to break down. And here we have carbon dioxide and water everywhere. This is more disordered. It has higher entropy. And this is actually a more stable situation. So respiration is a process that increases the entropy or the disorder of the system. In this situation, energy is released because in respiration we're breaking down glucose to release energy so that ATP can be made. And since energy is being released, this is called an exergonic reaction. So we have endergonic reaction, and then we have exergonic reaction. 
Now, this reaction is more spontaneous. Now, this reaction is more of a spontaneous reaction compared to photosynthesis. If we just left glucose out for an extended period of time, then it would eventually, on its own, break back down into water and CO2 molecules. It would take a while, but it would happen on its own. So since that can occur, then we say that this reaction is a spontaneous reaction. It doesn't take the input of energy for this reaction to occur. Now, I've been using the term free energy, and I said that free energy just simply means the amount of energy that is available to do work. And sometimes it's called Gibbs free energy, and that's because a scientist named Gibbs worked out these ideas related to free energy. So if you discover it, if you think of it, if you invent it, then you can plop your name on it, basically. So now we're going to look at the change, and that delta means change in free energy as a reaction progresses. So here I have two different graphs. And you need to be able to relate these graphs to either photosynthesis and respiration. You need to be able to draw these graphs and explain what they mean. So let's take a look at this first diagram. And we have free energy on the y-axis. And then let's add the reaction progression. To this x-axis. So our reaction is going to progress. We have reactants that are going to form products. Well, you can tell that initially the reactants have a very low amount of free energy. And then when the reaction is over and we have products, those products are storing a larger amount of free energy. So again, here's our initial amount of free energy. Here's our final amount of free energy. So from here to here, represents the change in free energy. Delta G means free energy. And I'm guessing the G stands for Gibbs free energy. Now, to go from a low amount of energy to a higher amount of energy, then that means that energy has to be added. So this is going to have a positive delta G. Now, I want you to put a plus there, and I want you to circle it. And anytime you see a plus when you're working a math problem, then that means to add, right? So when you see a positive delta G, I want you to think of that plus as add energy. So for this reaction to occur, energy has to be added. So the next question is, do you think this graph is representing photosynthesis or respiration? So think about which one of these reactions does energy have to be added to the system. And that's with photosynthesis, because we have to have light energy for those reactants to form the products, to form glucose. So this graph is showing you the change in free energy as the reaction progresses during photosynthesis. So photosynthesis has a positive delta G. And we just learned that photosynthesis is a non-spontaneous reaction. It doesn't occur on its own. It needs a considerable addition of energy for this reaction to take place. So obviously the graph over here is showing us respiration. So here we have the reactants, and you should be able to put the reactants and the products related to a process on the graph. So our reactants are oxygen plus glucose, and glucose has a lot of stored energy in it. So we start with high free energy in the reactants, and then we end up with a lower amount of free energy in the products, and the products are CO2 and water. So in this case, the change in free energy is negative. We have a negative delta G. Whenever we have a negative delta G for reaction, then that means that this energy, all of this from here to here, is going to be released. And this is an example of a reaction that is more likely to be spontaneous. So if there's a positive delta G, we have to add energy, and that reaction is less likely to be spontaneous. If we have a negative delta G, then energy is going to be released, and this reaction is more likely to be spontaneous. So let's note some other ideas in these boxes related to these two graphs.
for photosynthesis, delta G is positive. And I want you to remember that that positive means to add energy. This reaction is not spontaneous. And in photosynthesis, since it requires the input of energy, then we have an endergonic reaction. And remember, photosynthesis takes disorganized CO2 and water molecules, and it makes them more orderly as a glucose molecule. So photosynthesis is decreasing the disorder or the entropy of the system. So the entropy or disorder of the system is decreased. So basically, this top graph is showing you that energy is used to make a more organized molecule from more disorganized molecules like CO2 and water. So for the next graph, our delta G is negative. This reaction is more likely to be spontaneous. Since energy is going to be released, this is an exergonic reaction. And entropy is increasing because we're going from more organized molecules like glucose to more unorganized molecules like CO2 and water. So entropy or the disorder of the system increases. So again, this graph is showing you that energy is released whenever glucose is being broken down to CO2 and water molecules. So again, you should be able to draw these graphs, indicate what they're showing you, and relate these to either photosynthesis or respiration, or relate them to any endergonic reaction or exergonic reaction. So let's practice answering some questions about this graph that's showing the change in free energy as a reaction is progressing. The first question says, calculate the change in free energy for the reaction that's shown. So here are the reactants, and this is the energy in the reactants, and then we have the products. To calculate the change in free energy, we have to start with our initial amount of free energy, and there's our final amount. And the equation for this is actually your final minus your initial. So our final, let's say that's around 10, minus our initial, and it's 40, so we're going to get a negative 30. But some of you are simply going to look at this diagram, and you're going to see it drops 30, and so since it drops, we're going to put a negative there, negative 30. But how we're actually calculating it is it's final minus initial is giving you the change in free energy. Is the reaction spontaneous? Yes, it's more likely to be spontaneous. Is this an example of an exer or an endergonic reaction? So since we have a negative delta G, a negative change in free energy, then that means that this energy is going to be released. So this is an example of an exergonic reaction. Number four says calculate the activation energy needed for this reaction. Now, it doesn't matter whether a reaction is exergonic or endergonic, a little bit of energy has to be supplied to the system so this reaction can get started. So if you remember from the biochemistry unit, the reaction energy is just the amount of energy needed to start this reaction, to kind of get over the hump here. So we start at 40, and it looks like we go up to 70. So the activation energy needed for this reaction is going to be 30. So from here to here represents that energy of activation. And 5 says, add a line to show how the addition of enzymes would affect activation energy. And in the biochemistry unit, we learned that enzymes lower the amount of activation energy necessary for a reaction to occur. So there's one equation related to the change in free en energy. It's just the final energy minus the initial energy. And here's another equation related to Gibbs free energy. This equation is on your formula sheet, and I've indicated the information on your formula sheet here. 
So let's practice calculating the change in free energy. Again, that's what this means, is the change in Gibbs free energy as a reaction is progressing. And let's use this equation. Here we have a reaction that's taking place in the body. And this reaction occurs so that we can bind this toxic molecule, which is made by the breakdown of amino acids, into a form that is not toxic. And so this toxic ammonia molecule is being transported as glutamine. And it's not harmful whenever it's in that form. And it's going to be transferred to our liver for processing. Now, you know that you're going to use this type of equation when you start to see this term enthalpy, and you see a delta H, and you see entropy, and you have delta S. And you're also going to be given temperature. And note that it has to be converted to Kelvin. And remember, the conversion is take your degrees Celsius and add it to 273, and that's going to give you your temperature in Kelvin. So it says the reaction occurs at 20 degrees Celsius, the change in enthalpy, delta H. So let's plug that in. So I'm going to go ahead and write the equation right here for reference. You have delta H minus temperature times delta S. So our change in enthalpy is 4,103 calories. I'm going to show you how the units cancel so that you're just left with a unit related to energy. And let's minus our temperature. So our temperature is 20 degrees Celsius plus 273. So that's going to give us 293 Kelvin. And then we have our delta S, our change in entropy, is 2.4 calories per K. Now, when we multiply these two numbers, our units are going to cancel. So we're going to get a number that is in calories, and we're going to subtract that number from this one, which is also in calories. So our answer is going to be in calories. Multiplying 293 and 2.4 gives us 703 calories, and we're subtracting that number from 4,103 calories. And that gives us a plus, so we have a positive delta G, 3,400 calories. Now remember what this positive, what a plus delta G indicated. That means that energy is going to have to be added to this system so that these products are going to form from these reactants. And whenever that's the case, whenever you have an endergonic reaction, these reactions are not usually spontaneous. So we're going to say no. Now let's take a second to better understand this equation and the idea that if we add heat or we increase the temperature of a system, then we're more likely to take these reactions that are not spontaneous and actually make them spontaneous. So let me relate this idea to the equation. So again, we have delta G equals the change in enthalpy minus temperature times the change in entropy, or delta S. I'm just going to throw out some arbitrary numbers here. Um, for some of these variables. So I'm going to put a thousand here for delta H and I'm going to start with a temperature of 300 Kelvin and let's just say our change in entropy is 2. And again, I'm just throwing some numbers in here so you can understand how temperature could make a reaction become spontaneous. So whenever I factor all these together then I'm going to get 1,000 minus 600. So again, we have a situation where we have plus 400. We have a positive delta G. So this is telling you that this reaction right now is not spontaneous. Now, let's give this system more energy. Let's increase the temperature. Let's add some heat there. So I'm just going to use the same numbers for delta H and delta S. So let's start with 1,000. And I'm going to increase the temperature to 600 Kelvin. Again, delta S is 2. So when I multiply those numbers together, from 1,000, I'm going to subtract a negative 
1,200. So now we have a situation where we have negative 200 is our delta G. We have a negative delta G. So now this same reaction is spontaneous. So when we increase the temperature of a system, then we can make reactions more likely to become spontaneous reactions. Let's relate these statements to this idea that we just learned. We can maintain a constant body temperature, because remember we are endotherms, and this gives us an advantage over exotherms. So this is why we devote so much of our food energy just to maintaining our body temperature. If we keep an elevated temperature, then some reactions are going to happen spontaneously. If our body temperatures dropped, then we wouldn't be providing enough energy for these exact same reactions to happen spontaneously. It's a consistency of these reactions that's allowing us to live. So for reactions, we know that we need some form of energy to help these reactions take place. So that can be in the form of heat energy, which we just talked about. Um, ATP can provide energy for reactions. And all reactions, whether they're endothermic or exothermic, needs a little bit of energy, this activation energy, to initially break some of the bonds that are in those reactants. I want to relate back to this equation. I showed this to you on the previous page. And we calculated the change in free energy. And we got a positive delta G when we calculated the change in free energy at 20 degrees Celsius. Well, even if we are maintaining a body temperature at 36 degrees Celsius, and that's what it is, that's the equivalent of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, we still have a positive delta G. And I mentioned that this is a very important reaction. It helps us remove ammonia or put it in a form that's not toxic to our bodies. So here's a case where increasing the temperature in which this reaction is taking place is not causing this reaction to be spontaneous. So we're kind of out of luck. What are we going to do here? Because we need this reaction to take place, yet it's not going to happen spontaneously. Well, here's some options for us. Energy needed for these reactions can be supplied by heat, like we just mentioned, by increasing temperature. But I don't think that's an option for us. We're not going to be able to elevate our body temperatures much past 36 degrees Celsius. Another option is to provide energy using ATP. And I've included in this diagram right here this reaction that's taking place. And you can see that we're utilizing ATP. We need an input of energy for this reaction to occur. Another option for us is that we can use enzymes. So enzymes reduce the amount of activation energy that's needed in the system for these reactions to occur. If we have a reaction that is endergenic, like we're seeing here in this diagram, then we have reactants that have a lower amount of free energy compared to the products. So here's the reactants and here's the products. And we can use enzymes to reduce the activation energy. So it doesn't take as much energy for these reactions to occur. So let's indicate that is the line when we have an enzyme present. And if you look at this reaction, you can see that it takes a couple enzymes for this reaction to be complete. Without these enzymes, we would have had to supply more energy, more ATP molecules, or even elevate our body temperatures to get this reaction that's important to happen spontaneously. So that's why we see in the body for almost every reaction that takes place, there is an enzyme that assists it. And these reactions can be endothermic or exothermic overall, but there's still going to be enzymes that lower the amount of activation energy. Let's talk about why relying solely on increasing temperature is not a good strategy to provide the amount of energy needed for some of these reactions. Now, just to maintain your body temperature at 36 degrees Celsius takes a considerable amount of food, more so for you guys than me, because you're trying to maintain body temperature like I am, but you're also growing, which takes an excess of energy as well. 
So think about if you had to elevate your body temperature for these reactions to take place even past 36 degrees Celsius. Imagine the amount of food that you would have to consume so that you could break down molecules and generate heat. And let's consider some of the other molecules that make up you and your cells and what would happen if they were subjected to excessive heat. So molecules like proteins and your DNA. If we need to break down molecules like glucose, that means that we have to provide energy to break the bonds. Well, that would be great if we applied enough heat energy to break the bonds of glucose so we could break it down into ATP. But we're also going to be breaking molecules like proteins because we're going to also break the bonds that are giving proteins their structure. And an increase in temperature would be great, again, for breaking down glucose, but it's not going to be so great for DNA because we have those hydrogen bonds between those bases. And so we are denaturing DNA by increase in heat as well. So it's important that we keep a body temperature that allows some reactions to be spontaneous, and then we can use other methods to provide energy, like provide ATP and provide enzymes, and that allows us to keep a lower body temperature so we're not damaging other molecules in the body. Now, before we go to the next page, I want to relate again to this reaction that's taking place because this is an example of what we're about ready to talk about which is called a coupled reaction. So here we have a reaction taking place. We have this molecule is being converted into this molecule and at the same time we have ATP is being converted into this molecule. So this is an example of a coupled reaction. We put two reactions together and one is going to provide the energy for the other one to occur. In a coupled reaction, we are using an exergonic reaction. And remember, those are the reactions that release energy to provide energy for the reactions that need an input of energy, those endergonic reactions. To review a previous concept, let's look at this diagram and figure out which molecules or which reactions are going to need an input of energy because we're trying to make molecules more orderly or we're trying to decrease the entropy of the system. So here we have glucose being broken down into CO2 water and remember every reaction where there's a transfer of energy some of that energy is going to be lost as heat. So we see that in this diagram. We also have ADP and phosphate being put together into an ATP molecule. And then we also have ATP broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And then finally, we see we have amino acids, and it looks like they're being assembled into a protein. So we have several reactions taking place here. Let's start here with glucose and this first arrow. So when we are breaking down glucose, remember we talked about, we are increasing the disorder. We're going from more orderly atoms to less orderly atoms. So in this situation, we have an increase in entropy. This is an exergonic reaction. So it's going to release energy. We can use that energy to make ATP. So energy is going to be used so that an enzyme can put this third phosphate back onto ADP. So here's a situation where we have an endergonic reaction. This is a reaction that needs the input of energy because we're trying to decrease disorder or decrease entropy. We're trying to organize these molecules. So moving over here, we have ATP, which is an organized molecule that has low entropy. And remember, it's less stable now. Think of those built-up Lego structures and how it's really easy to break them. Well, we have a structure now that's more orderly, so it's less stable. It's relatively easy to break this molecule down. When we break down ATP into ADP and this organic phosphate, then we're releasing some of the energy. This is an exer gonic reaction. We are increasing entropy, increasing disorder. 
But as we release this energy, then we can use some of that energy to organize our amino acids into a protein. So we're going from amino acids that show high entropy, high disorder, and we're organizing them. We're bonding together with peptide bonds, and so we are decreasing entropy. This reaction is ender. Gonic. It takes the input of energy to make these amino acids more orderly. Now, in the next unit, we're going to focus more on respiration, but let's take a second to look at some of the initial steps of respiration and relate it to this idea of coupled reactions. So we know that respiration is taking glucose, utilizing oxygen, and we're making ATP. We're also going to release CO2 and water. So we're going to get energy out of the breakdown of glucose. Now what is kind of ironic is that to initially start this process, we have to provide a little bit of energy to break down this glucose molecule to start to rearrange the bonds between the atoms of glucose. So Breaking down glucose requires a little bit of activation energy, and this is provided by some ATP molecules. And you can see that here in this diagram. So starting off with respiration, we take glucose, and you can see here that we have a coupled reaction. That to take glucose and turn it into the next intermediate molecule in this process, it takes the input of energy. And that's being provided here by this ATP molecule. And again, another way to overcome activation energy that's necessary for some reactions to begin is we can utilize enzymes. So I wanted to show you this diagram so you can see every one of these steps is assisted by an enzyme. So for all these reactions, the amount of activation energy needed is lowered. And that's because these are all enzyme-assisted reactions. And that's what this diagram over here is attempting to show you, is that it would have taken this much activation energy to start the breakdown of glucose over here, but we don't need as much energy now because we have enzymes to help in those reactions.